Let's talk bok choy. Also called pak choy, this leafy green has a mild cabbage-like taste. Both the green leafy parts and the white stem can be eaten. And bok choy is often enjoyed in stir fries, steamed, or boiled. It's very high in vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin K, and makes a healthy addition to your dinner plate. There are two main types of bok choy that you can grow, dwarf and miniature varieties, or full-sized heads. Win-win. This one is very similar to joy choy, only smaller. It has a vase shape with large green leaves and white petioles. Toy choy, a dwarf or miniature variety with dark green leaves and white petioles. This variety is prone to bolting. Red choy, another small variety with red purplish leaves and light green petioles. This variety tends to bolt under heat stress and is known to wilt faster in storage than other varieties. Black summer, this variety has broad dark green leaves that grow in a vase shape with light green petioles. Bok choy grows best when directly sown rather than being transplanted. Its optimal soil temperature for direct sow is between 50 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 27 degrees Celsius, and it needs a minimum air temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit for germination. In general though, its minimum air temperature tolerance is 27 degrees Fahrenheit, negative three degrees Celsius, making it frost tolerant. On the other end of the spectrum, its maximum air temperature tolerance is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. Soil preparation. Bok choy needs fertile, well-drained, yet moisture-retentive soil with a pH between 6.0 and 7.0. Be sure to choose a spot that gets about eight hours of direct sunlight. Cultivate your soil before planting to make it nice and loose for your crop. And if you have heavy clay soils, it's best to use raised beds for improved drainage. Remove any large stones and debris from your soil. Then mix in with some well-rotted manure or complete organic fertilizer. Use one cup for every 10 feet. Lastly, level and flatten the soil to create an easy surface for seeding slash transplanting and growing. Plant three seeds every 12 inches, 30 centimeters for small varieties, or every 18 inches, 45 centimeters for full-sized or large varieties, about a quarter to a half inch deep. Rows should be spaced about 12 to 18 inches, 30 to 45 centimeters apart. Watering. The key to growing bok choy is consistent soil moisture during both germination and once your seeds emerge. Bok choy needs at least one inch, 2.5 centimeters of rain per week, and you'll need to irrigate during hot dry periods. Water your bok choy so that the soil soaks deeper than the top two inches, five centimeters. If you're using overhead sprinklers or a hose, water your plants early in the morning so that they have time to dry out by the afternoon. Thinning. Once seedlings have emerged, thin to the best seedlings so that there's one plant every 12 inches, 30 centimeters for small varieties, and one plant every 18 inches, 45 centimeters for full-sized or large varieties. Fertilizer. It's best to test your soil before planting so that you can detect any nutrient deficiencies that need to be amended. Bok choy thrives when well-rotted manure is mixed in with your soil before planting. You can also use an organic fertilizer, applying one cup every 10 feet, three meters. Keep in mind, if you're using any fertilizer to help with deficiencies, be sure to use one that's free of weed killer, as this can kill your crops. Mulch. Add a three to four inch, seven to 10 centimeter layer of an organic herbicide-free mulch, like straw or grass clippings to suppress weeds. When using mulch, leave a gap of about two inches, five centimeters between the stem of the plant and the mulch to prevent decay and disease. Transplanting best practices. Keep in mind that although bok choy can be transplanted, it really grows best when directly sown. 
You can transplant your seedlings outside about four to six weeks after sowing them indoors. Before planting though, you'll want to harden them off first. About a week before transplanting, take them outside and leave them in a sheltered place where they won't be damaged by wind or hot sun. If there's any risk of frost overnight, bring your plants back inside and take them out again in the morning. The idea is to accustom your plants to the outdoor conditions ahead of time to minimize their stress and shock when it comes time to transplant. Adjust their position so they receive a little bit more sun each day. Do's. Bok choy grows well with dill, mint, lettuce, onion, and scallions. Dill and mint attract predatory insects that control bok choy pest populations. Onions also repel pests and can improve the flavor of your bok choy. Don'ts. Great news, bok choy doesn't have any adversaries. Row cover. Using row covers after sowing or transplanting, at least for the first few weeks, can protect your young plants from the cold, insects, and wind. Just keep in mind that using heavy or thick row covers on your bok choy can increase the inside temperature too much and hinder their growth and development as young plants. If you choose to use row covers, be sure to secure it well over the hoops, as it can cause severe damage to your plants if it comes loose in the wind. Containers. Bok choy can be grown quite easily in containers, either indoors or outdoors. Choose a container with at least 12 to 18 inches of soil depth for your plant. Keep the required spacing in mind. You may be able to only have one plant per pot. But planting mini varieties, like toy choy, will allow you to grow more in smaller space. Make sure your container is well draining with holes in the bottom as well adding a layer of various sized rocks at the bottom of your container, before adding soil, can improve drainage too. Keep other growing conditions, like temperature and sun exposure in mind when placing your containers. Raised beds. You shouldn't have any trouble growing bok choy in raised beds. The depth of your beds will determine which varieties you can plant. Small varieties, such as toy choy and win-win, need between 12 to 18 inches of soil depth, while full-sized varieties, like joy choy, require a minimum of 18 inches of soil depth. Follow proper spacing instruction and make sure your raised beds receive the proper amount of full sun. Add organic matter to poor draining soil and a layer of rocks of various sizes to the bottom of your raised beds. Cabbage Looper Light to dark green caterpillars with wavy white lines on their back and sides and a distinctive arch in their back when they move. They feed on the leaves of a plant, which is also where they hide, causing ragged, large holes to appear. The damage they cause to plants is often quite severe. Here's what to do. Looper numbers are usually held in check by their natural enemies, other insects. If they do become problematic, loopers can be hand-picked from the plants. You can also apply certain safe bacteria, which effectively kills the younger larvae, as well as insecticidal soaps. Just try to avoid using chemical sprays, because they will also damage helpful insects. Weeds attract and shelter these pests, so it's also important to keep weed growth under control. Pests can also be prevented and controlled by using row cover slash insect netting when sowing or transplanting. As well, be sure to quickly remove any crop residue after harvest to prevent the looper from having a place to survive in over the winter. Cabbage Root Maggot These maggots feed on the roots of plants, creating tunnels and can actually destroy the whole root system, which impacts a plant's nutrient uptake and support. The first signs of damage from these pests are the wilting of plants in hot weather, or the yellowing or purpling of a plant's leaves. Later on, plants will collapse and can die completely. Unfortunately, once the damage from root maggots is noticed, it's usually too late to treat the maggot problem. Here's what to do. Practice crop rotation 
and avoid applying animal manure or green manure during the springtime, since rotting and decaying organic matter will attract these maggots. Be sure to remove any affected plants in the fall, including their roots, and destroy them. This will kill any maggots that might be left over. Row covers are also an effective option to help prevent adult flies from getting near plants to lay their eggs. Just be sure to set up the barrier by the time adult flies are laying eggs. Keep in mind too that it's best to choose a barrier that allows both sunlight and rain to get to the plants. Because of this, floating row covers might not be the best option for large gardens. Common organic cures for root maggot include spreading diametaceous earth, a natural powder made from the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures around seedlings, or using natural predators like spiders, ground beetles, and rove beetles to fend them off. In some cases, intercropping with clovers or legumes can also be helpful in limiting maggot infestations. Cabbage worm. This caterpillar is gray-green in color and slightly fuzzy. After it eats the leaves of plants, it leaves holes and wet green droppings behind. Here's what to do. Hand pick cabbage worms if you find them on any plants. There are also natural enemies like spiders, ground beetles, and parasitic wasps that will feed on these cabbage worms, which can be an effective and organic solution. Also, weeds attract and shelter these pests, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Cabbage worms can also be prevented and controlled by using row cover or insect netting when sowing or transplanting. Diamond Back Moth Their larvae, caterpillars, will be found on the undersides of a plant's leaves. They tend to spread on the leaves, snacking on the leaves, and causing little holes to appear. Here's what to do. Weeds attract and shelter diamondback moths and their caterpillars, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. These pests can also be prevented and controlled by using row covers or insect netting when sowing or transplanting. Finally, natural enemies like wasps and other predators usually keep these pests in check. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Black rot a soil or seed-borne bacteria that causes distinct lesions to form around the outsides of leaves. These lesions turn yellow slash orange and travel inward on the infected leaves, typically in a V shape. As well, these lesions might come together and give plants a scorched appearance. 
Leaf veins will then turn dark, and the stems of the plant might become discolored as well, with some dark rings on them. Leaves might wilt, dry out, and drop, and plants can eventually die. Black rot can happen at any stage of the growth process, and can be spread by splashing water, equipment, wind, people, or insects. The disease typically emerges in moist, warm conditions. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds or resistant varieties when possible. But before planting, soak the seeds in 122 degree Fahrenheit water for about 25 minutes to kill any lingering bacteria. Keep in mind that soaking seeds this way isn't 100% effective against black rot and might actually lower the seeds germination rate. As well, Practice a two-year crop rotation and only use clean, sanitized tools near any crops. Wash tools with a diluted bleach mixture, about one part bleach to 10 parts water. Then rinse with cool water and towel dry after each use. It's important to control the growth of weeds and to follow the recommended plant spacing to increase airflow around plants, while also allowing plants to dry their leaves quicker. Be sure to remove and destroy any infected plants and avoid overhead watering. Wire Stem A fungal infection that causes the hollowing of leaf stems, petioles. Here's what to do. Wire stem can be avoided in bok choy with shallow transplanting and by avoiding saturated soils, when soils are kept moist but not wet. Downy mildew. This fungal disease thrives in cool, humid climates. At first, downy mildew causes leaves to turn yellow, typically starting from the main vein, then spreading outward. Fungal spores that are grayish, purple, fuzzy spots will then grow on the undersides of leaves. Downy mildew typically affects young, tender leaves, and severe infections can also cause curled and distorted leaves. Sometimes those affected leaves can then become dehydrated and then drop from the plant entirely. When seedlings are affected, their growth is stunted and downy mildew can also reduce crop yields while acting as an entry point for other diseases. When older plants are affected, in addition to the lesions they get, they will also seem more rigid and narrow as compared to healthy plants. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties when possible. Practice good crop rotation. Ensure good air circulation around plants and water plants early in the morning. This last tip gives the plants enough time to dry out during the day, making those plants less vulnerable to infection. Downy mildew is usually spread when leaves are wet for too long, so it also helps to avoid overhead watering. As well, be sure to keep weeds from growing. Once plants have downy mildew, the best thing to try is to eliminate moisture and humidity around the infected plants. If possible, try to improve their air circulation through selective pruning. In general, downy mildew normally clears itself up in an outdoor garden once the weather warms up, since it doesn't do well in warm temperatures. Also, if there are any infected plants, be sure to remove all crop remains after harvest to avoid reinfection, since this fungus can survive in crop residue. Keep in mind too that downy mildew is much easier to control when a plant's leaves and fruit are kept protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin two weeks before the disease normally appears and when a long period of wet weather is in store. Copper treatments can also start when the disease first appears. Then those treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as the treatments are needed. For miniature varieties, harvest baby bok choy when the heads reach six to 10 inches, five to 25 centimeters in height. For full-sized varieties, They'll be ready once their heads are about 12 inches, 30 centimeters in height. Harvest the heads when the outer leaves are still tender. Typically, you'll want to harvest whole heads at a time. 
Cut them off at the base of the main stem, just above the soil line, so that the head stays intact. Be sure to use a clean, sharp knife and peel off any yellow or damaged outer leaves. Note, bok choy does not grow back after you harvest the head, so plant successively every two to three weeks if you'd like a continuous harvest. As well, bok choy doesn't keep in the garden for very long. Be sure to harvest any mature heads and keep your eyes open for signs of bolting. You'll need to harvest before the plants flower. Once harvested, store your bok choy at 32 to 36 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 to 3 degrees Celsius, in 90 to 95% humidity. Then, enjoy!